I think of all the sort of destruction, physical destruction that we excuse because it's permitted, you know, like in order to build a new building, you have to destroy an old one. You have to cut down all of the trees in the area to pave it over. And so there are many acts of destruction undertaken by sort of everyday work of corporations and humans, you know, doing agriculture. When we till the soil, we destroy its natural structure, but we're using it to grow food. And so like we engage in destruction constantly for the purpose of generation. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists, and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political, and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Rose Abramoff. Rose is an earth scientist interested in climate change, land management, and forest ecology. She started her career as a forest ecologist, researching fragile and vulnerable forest systems around the world. As Rose noticed the lack of action that governments were taking around the world to adequately tackle climate change, and the fact that they were not listening to the reports coming out of scientists' labs, she decided to take action. Rose began protesting with Extinction Rebellion and Scientist Rebellion, leading eventually to her being fired from Oak Ridge National Laboratory late last year. She's one of the first climate scientists to be fired for protests. She joined me today to talk about the importance of activism, why scientists are choosing activism, and how taking action can be thought of as an experiment, much like a science experiment. We talk about the social credibility. We talk about the social capital that scientists have, lending weight to their actions. We talk about the different forms of actions that are being taken around the world and the difference in culture surrounding action in Europe and the United States. This leads us to have a fascinating conversation around violence, sabotage, property and citizenship, where we discuss the theory behind the political text, how to blow up a pipeline, the binary of wanting to build a better world and perhaps being forced to use violent means, eventually exploring a reframing of action against property, which presents it as an ethical choice in the face of human suffering. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Rose, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for inviting me, Rachel. So my first question for you is, why is the world in crisis and what can we do about it? Why is such a difficult question for scientists to answer? Because I think mostly we are used to answering questions that are like, please describe the crisis that we're in um, (laughs) without ascribing any value to anything. But, you know, as far as I can tell, to me, the, the reason why we're in this crisis really doesn't have anything to do with the nuts and bolts of like how much we're emitting into the atmosphere, but to do with like the economic system, which basically, um, asks us to grow infinitely forever, (laughs) which is fundamentally incompatible with sustainable resource use. Um, And so, I mean, if I had to sort of point to one thing, which was the sort of the root of all evil, if you will, I would probably point to the structure of our economic system. Um, And and in a maybe a more philosophical, to think of it in a more philosophical way, it's the way that we relate or don't relate to the to the world. Um, we think of the earth as something that we can extract, like we're not a part of it. It's something that we take from and use and use up as opposed to like the sort of positioning of humans, you know, rather than being at the very top of the food chain and it's separate from, from all of the ecology of the world as being part of it and integrated with it. And sort of the most sustainable way of living is to recognize that we're just one species among, you know, millions of others that all have an equal right to live on this planet. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that there's some kind of alternate philosophical positioning that I think could get us to a much more sustainable economic system, a much more sustainable um, way of using resources and managing land um, and living. Absolutely. It's almost as if that hierarchy of the economic system is then embedded into our thought, like you said, as if we are above the earth and can somehow mm -hmm. survive without it. I mean, I swear that's what these people that won't you know, change our course seem to think, um, that we're somehow right. not dependent on the biosphere. Right. And it's interesting when you look at the types of solutions that people come up with within that framework. A lot of them are just as extractive as the types of resource extraction like coal oil and gas mining that have gotten us into this situation. It's like, oh, we're just going to mine all of the minerals to make enough electric vehicle batteries and we're going to have as many electric cars as regular cars. Like we don't need to change anything about our lifestyle, um, you know, and, and I'm all for electric cars. But of course, like in order to accomplish that complete transition, we really have to also reduce the total number of cars or else we're going to have these really extractive mining, um, you know, systems expanding. Um, and yeah, I mean, even this idea of like, oh, we'll just go to Mars, we'll go to the moon, like we're literally going to rise above the Earth, <laughs> which, you know, if you remember, I don't know if you remember sort of the Biosphere 2 era when, you know, a group of scientists tried to seal themselves inside of a bubble, essentially in Arizona. Um, oh, I don't know this Arizona, story. New Mexico. Yeah, it was the Biosphere 2 experiment, essentially a, a group of scientists thought, OK, we're going to recreate all the systems of Earth inside this sealed bubble um, to see if, you know, we could recreate it theoretically, like on other planets, moon, Mars, whatever, space stations. And they really weren't able to. I mean, there are a lot of and, and no one's really been able to accomplish that technical feat. Um, it, you know, we we do those sorts of um, experiments. Like when I was teaching laboratories in graduate school, we would do this experiment where we would put like a little bit of algae and some snails together in a jar. We would seal the jar and sort of the snails were supposed to sort of take up the oxygen that was provided by the algae and create this beautiful closed system. But, you know, in even like, you know, all of these students doing very careful calculations of like, oh, okay, what is the, how much oxygen is consumed by, you know, four grams of snails or whatever. <laughs> so, like, it's very difficult to do that math so precisely enough to maintain that system infinitely. Mm. It's really kind of a marvel that th that Earth has been able to sustain life for as long as it has. Um, and we've really never been able to create that system. Like we can create it for some periods of time. Biosphere 2 went on for a certain period of time before like a lot of the systems started to break down due to like various technical failures. And, you know, the International Space Station, like we have to keep resupplying it. It's not a sustainable system. So, yeah, like there's really no evidence that we can recreate her anywhere. And so it just seems ludicrous to me when these like tech billionaires are just like, oh, yeah, we're just going to leave Earth. And it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. It's a very, it's a very, well, I'm going to say it, it's my show. It's a very masculine notion, I would say. It is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, oh my God, it's so interesting that you say that because I think we could also recontextualize like all of these philosophical and economic frameworks into like things which have been invented by men. <laughs> and, and like more integrative holistic systems, which are, which have so much more of like the feminine in them. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and like stem much more from like matriarchal societies mm -hmm. um yeah that's really interesting i point. saw i mean and also maybe i think fair to know you know a specific cultural type of man uh, i like i saw this tiktok the other day that was this um person of color this guy and he was like yeah so there was this guy called marx and everyone thought that he had like created this like whole new way of devising an economy and organizing social relations. And then every indigenous community was like, that's just life, man. <laughs> You've just put a name on a thing that we have been doing for tens of thousands of years. <laughs> I am a white man and I have invented sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, not to alienate some of the listeners who are very supportive of the show and who fall into that category, <laughs> but I'm sure even they yeah. would notice the homogenous uh, characteristics of the people making bad decisions around the world at our current moment. Um, mm -hmm. So let's get into your work. So you are one of the scientists that has been sort of rebelling. You're part of uh, Scientist Rebellion. You've been doing uh, direct nonviolent action and you were fired from your position in January, one of the first Earth system scientists, let's say definitely in the global north, um, to lose their job over taking action. Now, first of all, can you 
walk us through that story, including why you felt the need to take action and not just, you know, continuing research in the lab. Sure. I mean, it really started over the course of my career. I had been studying how climate change affects ecosystems on land, a lot of vulnerable ecosystems like these fire prone Mediterranean forests, these pest prone temperate forests, the Arctic tundra, which is like melting and releasing carbon dioxide methane at these, you know, much higher rates than than other types of ecosystems. And it, it was just getting to the point where I thought, you know, is this the rest of my life? Like, I'm just going to be calmly documenting the destruction of our planet? Like, is this the best use of my time? Which isn't to say that I don't think that research is very important. Like, I'm still doing all of that research. Um, But like, there had to be, you know, there had to be something else, like another way that I could use this sort of like knowledge and social capital, because there is sort of social capital that comes from being a scientist. You have all of this sort of like public prestige around mm-hmm. the education, you know, whether or not it's deserved, like the the system of like Western knowledge that we've all like run, run the gauntlet through has given us this sort of public credibility. And so there has to be a better way to make use of that. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, I had been engaging in various types of activism, you know, it started, you know, I feel like there's a sort of um, like, like science communication and education is like the gateway drug to activism. So like all these scientists start off, you know, like tabling at farmers markets and like teaching kids about how, you know, the sun reflects off of light surfaces or whatever. And and then sort of slowly I started working with like nonprofits that were creating, you know, like sort of mobilized like art projects meant to mobilize people to action using climate data. Um, I was doing sort of like volunteer consulting work for like, Extinction Rebellion, you know, like going through their documents and making sure like these facts were updated um, about, you know, how what the carbon budget was and how much we expected at warming by mid-century. And um, and I basically thought in my mind, OK, you know, when I was in grad school, I basically thought, OK, I'm going to wait until I'm, you know, a prestigious, you know, late career tenured scientist. And then I'm going to chain myself to the White House like James Hansen. <laughs> Which is essentially what he did in, in 2011, I think, um, to protest one of the pipes, pipeline expansions of the United States. And and every you know few years that pass, I would see the new IPCC reports that came out. I would see the new research and think, okay, we have to do this sooner. Like I don't have time to wait until I'm, you know, a grizzled tenured professor. <laughs> um, and so essentially, when I started my first permanent position, which was the staff scientist position at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, I thought, okay, this is it. Like, I have, I I am a scientist. I have a position. Um, Like, let's do it. And so I started working with Scientist Rebellion at that point. um, And, you know, they're a group that does nonviolent civil disobedience, um, as well as a lot of other kinds of activist activities. And so I participated in this day of action where they had, you know, many hundreds of scientists all around the world risking arrest um, to, you know, stand against fossil fuel projects. Or, you know, in the United States, we were I was working with this group called Declare Emergency to ask, you know, President Biden to declare a climate emergency. So there are these sort of different goals in different places. But essentially, it was about like ending the fossil economy. Um, and and at that point, I thought, you know, there I might be fired because work, my my job really did have a bit of a reaction. They were sort of like, well, we can't tell you not to do this, you know, because of free speech and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But like, isn't, wouldn't it be great? You know, I had a couple of meetings with my, you know, upper line management where they essentially said, you know, we would like to encourage you to, you know, maybe you could make some educational videos. And it's like, I make educate, you know, like I've been making educational videos this whole freaking time, man. It's like nothing, nothing politically useful has occurred from that. Um, and so... You know, I knew that there would be pushback. And so, but anyway, I kept engaging in actions all throughout that year. Um, and, I, and I don't think my, my employers were very happy about it. The thing that basically triggered my firing, which I think was more of like the excuse, like I think they weren't mm-hmm. super happy with what I had been doing throughout the year, um, was that um, myself and uh, my friend and colleague, Peter Kalmus, who's another climate scientist at NASA, we unfurled this banner in front of a plenary at an earth science conference, the largest earth science conference, you know, tens of thousands of scientists, a lot of whom study climate change. And basically said, like, please take action. The banner said out of the lab and into the streets. Mm -hmm. Um, And we made this very short plea to take action. We were kicked out of that conference. um, And yeah, Gridge fired me, basically citing the fact that I had done engaged in a personal personal activity 
on company time because I was at that conference presenting my research about climate change, um, you know, sort of like as an Oak Ridge scientist. Um, wow. Yeah. So that's what had happened. I mean, uh, uh, okay, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm, and maybe you're not allowed to divulge, but maybe, um, you know, I'm sure that you had, did you have conversations with them afterwards to try and like understand their thinking? Were they forward with their thinking? Because it does seem mad that given what science is saying about the state of the planet, that you would be penalized for any kind of action. Because I mean, Oak Ridge National uh, Laboratory isn't going to exist in a decade if we <laughs> continue in the way that we are. Just the cognitive dissonance of it. I mean, what was happening at the management level to kind of allow that decision? Yeah. And I think, you know, and I had, uh, I won't mention like anyone's names, mm -hmm. but I'll just say like, man, you know, like my management, various managers in general, um, were very concerned. And I think the Department of Energy in general, not the Department of Energy, I'm um, sorry, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is, is managed by this like kind of government subcontractor called UT Battelle. Um, which was the entity that decided to fire me. But they get all of their funding from the federal government, from the Department of Energy. Um, and so Congress more or less legislates like how much funding they get for different programs. And so, you know, and this is all kind of through unofficial conversation, but m most people at the laboratory are very concerned about basically alienating like the current administration because it affects, directly affects their funding. And so they sort of can't, people are quite like concerned about, you know, not taking a public stance. Like that's kind of the party line, not just at the national laboratories, but at all institutions, which are essentially funded by, you know, federal funding like the National Science Foundation or whatnot, is, is to basically not make policy statements as scientists in general. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're allowed to talk about what our research is. Um, sometimes we can, you know, maybe get a little close to commenting on, you know, well, if you want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, you might, you could do some of these things, but we sort of can't say like, and we should do that mm -hmm. or like, and we should, you know, <laughs> like we're, you, like, we're basically not allowed to state our values, um, which I think is really interesting because it, it sort of sends the message to people that science is this value free enterprise, which and a lot of people think that they're like, oh, we're just, you know, searching for truth. But, you know, the way we do science is so full of values. I mean, so like Oak Ridge National Laboratory, for example, is like all of their funding is set by Congress. Like it's political process that decides sort of what are the priorities of things that we should study. A great example of that is like this laboratory was formed in the few years between I think it was like around 44. It was like 44 and she, during World War II, they basically built the laboratory from scratch in less than three years in order to assemble the atom bomb. Like that was the purpose of the laboratory. It wasn't like the search of truth. They weren't like, let's learn more about nuclear physics just for fun. Like it was a very political aim. Mm. And science in general has political aims. Like even some of them are altruistic, like let's cure cancer. But it's it's still a value judgment. Like the value judgment is that we care about the lives of people who have cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so like. The things that we choose to study and how we choose to study them are like imbued with value all throughout. And so I feel like it's a little bit silly <laughs> for us to pretend that we don't have values as individual scientists and as institutions. I think the issue here was essentially that our values clashed. Like my values were we need to like dismantle the fossil fuel industry as quickly as possible. <laughs> and, you know, the, the Biden administration's values are not that, <laughs> as we've seen um, in a lot of recent, you know, policy decisions. Mm -hmm letting the Willow Project go forward, the Mountain Valley Pipeline, you know, we've seen a lot of expansion of fossil fuel um, permitting in this recent administration. So, like, obviously those values are at odds. Mm. You know, we have the same thing in the, in the journalism industry, that journalists aren't supposed to, like, you know, portray their own values um, or come down on any sort of one side. And it does, again, it's just back to that cognitive dissonance of, like, when we are talking about the health of our planetary systems and therefore the future of human civilization and all of the species that we share this planet with. It just seems mad that any kind of objectivity would still be held to be a value that we should all be reaching for when if we don't take action and if we don't collectively decide to do something, then everything as we know it stops. Right. Yeah, like there's a sort of trump card of survival um, and then there's also just this idea of like, 
We obviously are humans who vote and have feelings and opinions and are part of communities. So it's almost a little disingenuous for us to pretend that we don't have opinions. Like, I feel like better for better for someone who disagrees with me to know what my values are, what my bias might be, and then interpret what I'm saying. Exactly. Um, then for me to, ha- to hide that and mm-hmm. say, you know, I have no opinion on the matter whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, in a way, like, I don't necessarily think bias is bad. Like, one of the beautiful things about the scientific method is that it works, even though every it's you, it's operated on by humans, all mm-hmm. of whom have opinions about things. Mm-hmm. You know, like, that's why we have this system for, like, collecting evidence and critical review from peers who are not us. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's sort of unnecessary. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've spoken to quite a few scientists and even some sort of researchers who are trying to like thinking about creating a new value set with which to imbue science to kind of move away from this pretense that individuals do not have a value set of themselves and trying to understand like the field of and the tree of knowledge and the field of like knowledge accumulation as being put to service for the benefit of of people rather than political agendas or profit seeking. Now, tell me, it seems to me though that scientists because of your social capital because of the legitimacy that you bring um if there were enough to join scientists rebellion then there would have to be some kind of forced action because you know laboratories can't fire everyone because then they won't get funding for anything because then they won't have anybody to do the research and how is that sort of conversation going within the scientist community are more and more coming on board with that understanding? I think, you know, Scientist Rebellion is growing every day. I don't know that we've reached this space where we're, where we're like, okay, we're going to do like a general strike or something. Um, although I feel like a lot of the different groups that have social capital, you know, because there's it's not just scientists. There's like a doctor's mm-hmm. rebellion and a lawyer's rebellion. There's sort of the first responders. Mm-hmm. There's all of these sort of different groups, the elders um, that are joining kind of like the youth and the indigenous movement, which more or less like started the this climate movement mm-hmm. um, to try and basically support them and sort of lend that social capital. Mm-hmm. Um and it would be nice, you know, if we could all get together, like all of these different labor categories, essentially, and yeah. say, OK, like we are the means of knowledge production and other types of production. Mm-hmm. And you have to listen to us. Um, at the moment, I feel like we're more on the tactic of trying to stand in the way of specific projects like fossil fuel projects, like private and <laughs> private aviation. Um, the, you know, getting getting in the way of political processes like chaining ourselves to government buildings mm-hmm. and whatnot, um, interrupting Senate hearings. Um, so, and you're seeing I mean, success. I mean, like I think it's worth noting that it does seem to be well. Obviously, the movement as a whole is progressing and and winning. You know, fights. But it was, you know, if I remember correctly, it was the Scientist Rebellion protesting against private aviation that kind of forced the European Commission to take a look at that policy. Can you can you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. And and I mean, this is one of the things like it's kind of great to be scientists in this context because we're constantly testing new tactics and seeing mm-hmm. what happens. Um, and I do find that basically, yeah, the higher risk nonviolent tactics do seem to be the most effective, um, especially those that are, are disruptive in some way. Um, so one good example on the airport, um, in the airport protests was the Schiphol Airport, which is a collaboration between a lot of groups, including Scientist Rebellion and Greenpeace was leading it, um, where, you know, they had like dozens of activists riding around on bicycles oh, on the tarmac. Was brilliant. That was, it was so yeah, like, funny. Visually interesting, <laughs> hilarious, like meaningfully disruptive. Mm-hmm. Planes could not safely take off mm-hmm. that day. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were a lot of arrests, which generated media interest. Um, and as a result of that and the sort of sustained private jet campaigns coming from other, you know, fronts of the activist movement, that airport, the Schiphol, the Schiphol Airport um, in Amsterdam, basically said, OK, we are planning to ban private jets by 2025 or 2026. Like they have actually instituted a plan to phase out private aviation at their airport, Amazing. which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, 
And so we've seen those kinds of policy movements in other places. Like there was a scientist rebellion, private jet action in Ibiza, where one of their political parties also submitted a policy to the European European Commission to sort of say, okay, like, can we phase out private jets um, in the Balearic Islands where Ibiza is located? And, you know, I'm not sure what the status of that now is, but like we're seeing these policy movements and we're definitely moving the Overton window, um, you know, like. France already had this in the works, but they've gone ahead and banned short haul flights. Like I think that, especially in Europe, where they're a little bit further ahead than North America, um, are really starting to sort of phase out and think differently about private aviation um, and aviation in general. I think it's worth noting as well on that France point. Uh, for everyone listening, that was a policy recommendation from the Citizens Assembly that they had on the climate emergency. That came mm-hmm. from the people, not from the politics, and the politics decided to implement it. So it's just sort of a, a double win for these processes that Extinction Rebellion say will be effective and should be implemented. And that's what you're seeing. They are. Now, you yeah. had this great line in your um, New York Times opinion piece, which I'd like to read out. I was so taken by it. Um, great experiments push at the boundaries of knowledge and propriety. They are risky, volatile, blasphemous. But when they work... The world changes. And I just think that is such a beautiful way to encompass the action that scientists are taking around the world. And everyone who is um, of a, a working profession to kind of lay down the, the, the normal paradigm of what that, meant, what that is meant to entail and what it's meant to achieve and to experiment with the act of, well, citizenship, quite frankly, now and demanding. Um, you said that there's been sort of good uptake from from nonviolent uh, direct action. What have you found over the years of of your activism? And also, are you guys like doing? Are you like studying it in the way? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, are you studying it? All of the, these different research tact, uh, tactics, not research. Yeah, tactics, I mean, action tactics. I'm not sure. So we, so we working groups form and collapse constantly, but we do have working groups that are like engaging in somewhat more of the academics of activism. And there are certainly academics like um, uh, Dana Fisher, who works at UMD. Actually, she might have just changed institutions, but um, she's a sociologist, IPCC, the working group three author, who's like been studying us <laughs> um, and studying act- the activist movement in general, sort of how well it works. And um, and there are other research groups like this, too, that are basically studying like what tactics are useful. Like, does it matter if that tactics piss people off? Like, like, is that worse or is that better? Um, and also looking at these tactics from a more kind of historical lens, like what's worked in the past in, you know, the suffragette movement, civil rights movement, in past movements that might teach us a little bit more about how to guide this movement in the present. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of scholarship going on that's really interesting. And we are trying to follow it um, and, and, you know, stay up to date and and also like try new things. Like to some extent, we're also like the knowledge creators. Like we have to keep trying new things and see what happens. Um, so there is a little bit of pressure on us to like not only stay up to date with the scientific literature, but also to be creative because, you know, scientific literature isn't necessarily going to suggest new <laughs> new things for us to be doing. Um, right. You meant to provide the scientific literature with things to evaluate. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so we're uh, in this case, we're a bit more the guinea pigs than we are the um, the the, the scientists. <laughs> You said um, that obviously Biden has shown that he is committed to sort of the expansion of the the fossil economy. And the whys of that are, I am sure, nuanced, but it is sort of disastrous um, in terms of the big picture. Has there been any interest uh, from government bodies in speaking with the activist movements or specifically the scientist rebellion movement to um, asking them to come in, explain, negotiate as we have seen in the past with civil rights movements, there is a tipping point when, you know, the guys in charge go, yeah, all right, fine, come in, let's talk. Yeah, I don't think we've reached that point yet. I mean, individual activists are, are especially those that are working a little bit closer to the beltway of politics um, or that target politics directly are sometimes invited to speak, like at local levels, for example, like Extinction Rebellion Boston, like we have some members who actually have relationships with specific um, Congress pe- state Congress people in Massachusetts, which is quite a progressive um, Congress, but of course still hasn't moved to ban fossil fuel infrastructure. So sometimes they're invited for meetings, um, but that usually happens on a much more local level where there are individual relationships that are possible mm. between like these groups. 
at national levels, like, yeah, we've not been contacted by the Biden administration. Um, and I think at this point, well, uh, you know, our, our job is essentially to push their rhetoric and not necessarily to negotiate with them. I think, you know, if you look at sort of the civil rights movement era, like there was a time when you know, at some point in, in the later parts of the movement, you know, Lyndon Johnson was speaking with Martin Luther King Jr. Like they were having this dialogue. But before that happened, the movement really had to escalate. And, and we haven't even seen that. Like we don't have anything similar to what Malcolm X is doing. Right. Yeah. Like like the left flag is still, especially in the United States, extremely polite. Mm. Um, you know, we're chaining ourselves to things. We're sitting down in front of things like there's not that. You know, and I'm not necessarily advocating, you know, the sort of like level of violence that it, but but. But just historically, like there has often been like a very sort of radical, scary left, which which pushes the sort of nonviolent groups into this more moderate area, which where where then it's like, okay, politicians can negotiate with us. We're the reasonable ones. And I don't think we've reached that stage yet. I think like, you know, people sitting in trees in Atlanta are the radical, violent activists, even though they're absolutely not doing anything that could be considered violence Um, and you're being, you know, labeled domestic terrorists. So I feel like we're not at that place yet. Like there's not been that escalation. Um, It's it's still quite a tidy and polite movement. And and yeah, I'm not really sure what's going to change that except for time and like, you know, increasing shocks to the climate um, that also tend to motivate action. Have you read Andreas Malm's How to Blow Up a Pipeline? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I've also watched the movie. <laughs> uh, for anyone listening that hasn't read it, it is a sort of study and a call to action that says that um, every single sort of progressive movement has won after the um, appearance of a radical flank that pops up after a moderate flank is not invited to the table. And it is the existence of the radical flank that makes the moderate flank as Rose, you just explained, seem more palatable and seem worth uh, d- discussing with. Um, and Andrea certainly, I'm not sure if he calls for it exactly, but he certainly asks the question why the environmental movement hasn't taken more radical action. If it is the future of the planet that we're talking about, how is it? Like, have they kind of hamstrung themselves into just uh, nonviolent civil disobedience? At what point are we going to understand that that cannot be the only tactic at work? Now, it's right. obviously, it's it's a really, really interesting debate. I know quite a few activists that are kind of like horrified by that kind of thought um, because mm-hmm. they say, you know, if you want to build a new world, if you want to build a better world, it cannot be built on the tactics of the old ones. Um, and how wonderful would it be to have a progressive movement kind of burst through on the values of kindness and compassion and care? because that's the society that we want to go through to. There are others yeah. that say, you know, no, this is something that we are going to have to do because kindness and care, care and compassion isn't getting us invited to the table and it's an emergency. We're running out of time. Mm-hmm. What's your personal opinion on it? Well, I think like like Andreas Malm, I do think it's worth like getting a little bit into the nuance of what constitutes violence. Yes. Because I think there's some discussion in that book of sort of, like there are shades to what we call violence. And it's interesting to me, for example, in the United States, where most uh, mainstream activist groups have basically said, OK, we're completely nonviolent, which means we also do not damage property, like no window cracking, basically no vandalism, mm-hmm. um, no spray paint. Whereas a lot of European groups will, you know, I lived in fr- France for three years, which has a very vibrant protest culture. I was there during the sort of Gilets Jaunes era. And every weekend in Paris, trash cans were on fire. <laughs> and so there's a little bit like, you know, and there's this recent, um, I read about a recent protest in, in France against a major motorway being built where they essentially went out and they built a concrete wall in yeah. the middle of the highway. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the United States, like we would consider the, you know, mainstream activist groups in the United States would consider that to be violence. What? Um, but I don't right, right exactly yeah because it 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 attacks it's kind of directly infrastructure right what no, it doesn't um, it attacks no I know the flow of traffic yeah. right my point is my, yeah and essentially my point is like that you know it it's it, yeah it's interesting to me like the ways in which we really value property like that to me is an extremely like infinite growth capitalism you know hyper masculine and extractive and colonialist thought this idea that like 
property is as important as like the lives and comfort and kindness that we show people. Like mm-hmm. we must show that same love and kindness to property and respect to property. Mm-hmm. And so in that way, I think that we could redefine you know, nonviolence to include property destruction, um, destruction of specific property, which is essentially like doing violence upon future generations or present generations of people in the global south. And so, yeah, I mean, I do think it's it's a it's it's an interesting debate. Um, and I definitely think that if culture goes into it a little bit, like to me, the protest culture in Europe is a lot different and sort of makes um, some concessions as to, you know, things that we can include in nonviolence that that other cultures might consider to be violence. Um, and like my thinking on it is also always sort of evolving because I, too, am sort of of the school of, well, if we want to create this like better, kinder world, like we need to practice that, you know, and sort of prefigure that sort of consensus based, like kindness and love based movement. Um, but at the same time, and like I truly believe in that. So in some ways, like I am very committed to nonviolence. But in other ways, I also see that that urgency and there are probably some pragmatic ways in which we could really try to meaningfully prevent that emergency. Um, and maybe there are completely nonviolent ways to do that. You know, maybe we can occupy the space in front of a future pipeline being built with with our bodies, right, which doesn't interact with property at all um, and like, you know, only puts at risk the people who are involved in that particular action. But at the same time, there are also potentially much, much easier and more effective ways to do that that don't necessarily harm or cause, you know, like dozens of people to go to prison um, and have to sort of interact with our very um, kind of repressive carceral state. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, I think it like... It's interesting you just said, you know, that, that we could like use our bodies in order to do that. And it's like so interesting, isn't it? That so much of our autonomy is essentially like, how can I direct this meat bucket to be most it's- effective, right? Like it is, you know, it's why should it be that it is people's bodies that have to stand in the way of danger when, you know, mm-hmm. instead you could sabotage is the word that Malm uses. You could sabotage some property, you could sabotage some infrastructure and then the danger isn't on any body, any phys- any one physical person, any one physical body, but rather is about sort of directly tackling the infrastructure that allows for, you know, the global warming and this e- e- ecological biodiversity, water, energy crisis to, to continue. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I wonder how much it is like an internalization of being, um, of having only one thing to barter with on the labor market like one's body mm-hmm. and one's time. Um, mm-hmm. And if being trapped in kind of like the maws of capitalism for so long under that sort of contract have kind of reduced our imanag- imaginative capacity um, for taking other forms of action alongside this indoctrination that actually like, I don't know, because we identify ourselves or people are identified by what they own in the world. Like I am what I own and therefore an attack on my property is a direct attack on me. It is as if it is a physical attack. And that's what makes it violence rather than sabotage. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, the sort of idea that, like, as humans, we can use tools in order to engage in progress. Uh, like, you know, so-called progress. Like, hmm. um, like advancing our material desires. But when we want to sort of advance our psychic desires or like take a stand it's it's like the only thing we're allowed to use are our bodies Um, that is interesting um it's actually something that i haven't thought too much about like i know that the activist movement uses a lot of tools but those tools are generally framed as art you know it's like puppets and signs and banners and t-shirts um and they're they're sort of tools used for generation rather than destruction Hmm. um very important but i mean yeah, no, I mean, and I, and I do like to focus on those things, but there are there are machines which need to be destroyed if we're going to make the energy transition. Um, and they can either be taken apart by those companies who have, you know, publicly committed to making that transition willfully, calmly, or they can be taken apart by other stakeholders. Um, and it'll be really interesting to me to see 
which of those comes to pass. I have a hypothesis, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, so do I. Who's going to get to it first? <laughs> yes, so do I. And I mean, listen, like I'm not, uh, I am not advocating for any kind of like violence either. And like uh, emotionally, I'm, I'm like you, I feel torn between, you know, that is the kind of world that I want to be- build and that's the kind of, you know, love, compassion and kindness. That's the direction that I want to take. But like mm-hmm. all that stuff is in my way. <laughs> what if we just went through it? And <laughs> right. <laughs> I was speaking with a friend about this last weekend. Uh, we went for a walk and um, we were talking about this exact topic. And I said, you know, but if we envision like a scenario, you know, say we have um, a woman and her child in a house and they are locked in that house and they're locked in that house with an abusive, bigger person, let's say a man. Mm-hmm. Um, and that person, you know, abuses them, eats them, rapes them. And she tries to get out. She tries and she tries and she tries to escape. She tries to take her child. She tries everything and nothing works until one day she realizes that the only option she has left is to kill him in order to get out. And so she kills this abuser in order to protect her and her child. And I said, in any like telling of that story, would anybody denigrate that woman's actions? You know, like, is that not an act of love? That, that mm-hmm. desire to protect her child, to protect the, that which is like most precious and vulnerable uh, and to protect herself. And my friend turned around and went, I think you've got to be really careful with that preposition of love. Like, I don't think you should call any violent action an act of love because then that opens the door for justifying all sorts. However, mm-hmm. perhaps you could say it's an act for love. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that that was so beautiful and important and it's really stuck with me and it's I suppose it's kind of helped me emotionally begin to parse through this difference of like I want to build a kinder compassionate more loving world there's these things in my way can we not just go through them how do I um (laughs) how do I accept both of these things to be true at the same time and I think defining that as like an act for love like maybe this thing like in doing it, we know that this is not the thing that we want to do and that we want to continue. And that we, this is not, this is like the last option type thing. And it, and no part in our manifesto and our thinking is it understood that this is like part of the building of the world, but it's actually part of like the taking down of the world so that a new one can emerge. Yeah. I mean, often when I think about things like just dis- like destruction, especially when it comes to property, I think about like these other concepts which are so malleable, like, you know, the idea of whiteness, like mm-hmm. historically changed changes over time, depending, you know, like like Syrians aren't white, even though they're incredibly light skinned. It's just because they are like an immigrant population, you know what I mean? And sort of the ways in which that changes depending on political context. And I think of all the sort of destruction, physical destruction that we excuse because it's permitted, you know, like in order to build a new building, you have to destroy an old one. You have to cut down all of the trees in the area to pave it over. And so there are many acts of destruction undertaken by sort of everyday work of corporations and humans, you know, doing agriculture. When we till the soil, we destroy its natural structure, but we're using it to grow food. And so like we engage in destruction constantly Mm -hmm. for the purpose of generation. And but but we sort of but it lives within this framework of like, this is how we do this thing. And therefore it's a violence. And so I think it's sort of, it sort of makes me wonder, like, are there ways to think about the kinds of things which need to be destroyed and rebuilt, you know, as like, well, we're not just destroying this to be assholes. I don't know if I can swim in this pond. Yeah, you can. (laughs) But (laughs) great. Because I did. Um, But but like, we're doing it to build this better thing. Um, And here's the better thing which we plan to build. So, you know, in a way, I almost feel like if we've engaged in enough like prefiguration of sort of like this is the thing which we're going to build on top of this thing which must be destroyed, mm-hmm. like in a way almost turns the destruction part into, well, we're just clearing the land for this great solar farm or whatever, you know, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be something so specific like that. Um, oh, I but, love that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I think, I mean, even if sort of, I suppose if we think in terms of like earth cycles and ecosystems, 
it's not as if this is going to be such a stupid sentence to say to a scientist, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's not as if... Do it. (laughs) It's not as if the trees that were growing like 80 million years ago are still bloody growing. Or do you know what? I don't even know how many million years ago. But it's not as if they're still growing. Like everything goes through these cycles of, you know, growth, stasis, and then uh, decay. And if we could like compost the machines, you know, if we could Mm -hmm. see that kind of just like, we're just composting. The neoliberal world We're composting order. the fossil fuel We're industry. Compost- just <laughs> saying. <laughs> We're just composting it. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to get some nice things out of it, including some good food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. maybe some renewable energy. Like, don't, don't worry about it. It's not violence. It's just composting. I mean, the great majority of that infrastructure can be directly um, used in green energy projects. Mm-hmm. You know, like a lot of that pipe, a lot of the like actual structures can be used in a totally different economy in many different contexts in a much more sustainable way. So like, you know, it's like theoretically you, you wouldn't really need to destroy any of it. You basically just need to convince them to take that transition. Um, but, you know, we're going to see how, how well that goes. Um, um, oh, I love that. Sorry, I'm just so taken with that <laughs> with that little thing. Cop- we're composting mm. the fossil fuel economy. Yeah, I mean, I really think a lot of like what we consider violence comes from how we interpret it and Mm -hmm. how like how it affects us emotionally and psychologically. Like there are a lot of especially when it comes to property, like it's really just a matter of like what we wanted to do with that, like how it you know what I mean? Like like if it's just a part of building a different thing, then it's not destruction anymore. Mm. You know. There was an interesting story. God, I can't remember when it was. Maybe like two or three years ago. Maybe longer. Maybe not as long. Um, But essentially in like very wealthy parts of London, overnight these like bikes emerged in front of these like private Mm -hmm. properties um, because there were overhangs and homeless people were sleeping in those those alcoves Mm -hmm. essentially under the overhangs and these Mm spikes emerged to stop them. And Mm -hmm. the next night, the community went out well, some community somewhere came around and removed those spikes and they kept mm-hmm. doing it. Every time they were put in, same like the next day, these people, well, the next night, would people would come undercover and remove them. And like mm-hmm. that, you know, is like a violence against property. And yet it just sure. seemed so ethically correct. Like that was supported mm-hmm. by the vast majority of the population. And so mm-hmm. if we can just continue to like make those direct links between like this specific infrastructure is harming like these specific people and therefore like the ethical thing to do is to compost it dismantle it and compost it you know mm-hmm. um I melt just, those spikes down and build a shed melt those spikes down homeless. and build a shed build a town hall where everyone build can gather house. and have a nice little you know town assembly around you know where do we want our next solar patch to be like this just mm-hmm. yeah um I think that there's, I genuinely believe in like the, the sort of, um, that people hold typically like good ethical values. And I understand that they get like sort of um, thwarted at times or twisted by political ideologies. Like, you know, the thing that I love most about conservatives is like, they're really community oriented. It's just that their community is really small. <laughs> like who they do for that. And so, but it just means that they still have this same ethical principle as exists on the left wing, which is like, we need to take care of people, except their people Mm -hmm. is very small and there's only people who look like them and then even only people typically that they know. Um, But it just speaks to this like capacity that we all have, this like sort of moral beating heart that exists, Mm -hmm. I would say, in like the vast majority of people around the world, that if you can like present a case that makes it, I don't know, and I'm sure this is happening. Maybe I'm revealing my lack of knowledge here. But if you can present a case for why it's not just necessary, but it's actually like morally correct, mm-hmm. I think that that could be, I don't know. I think that that could be like a very interesting way to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that case is floating around. I'll, mm-hmm. I'm not sure like sure. too many people are willing to make it publicly. Like, you know, even like mom and his book about how to blow a pipeline where he doesn't actually describe how to blow up the pipeline is very academic, sort of like, so that, you know, you can imagine him having some plausible deniability of like, oh, well, I don't necessarily, I'm not advocating for this. I'm just describing Mm. some possibilities. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yes, yeah, so, so am like, I, I think, by the way, everyone. I'm just describing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, if the FBI is listening, we're yeah. not advocating for violence. We, <laughs> we, ha- we have the utmost respect for the law. Um, <laughs> and we're not. We're advocating for, well, we're discussing composting. It's a very different thing. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, I think that that's like an element that sort of like prevents like that reframing um in the larger activist movement but i also think that we're still kind of in early it's still early stages um i i feel like we're sort of still in early days of this movement Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that in that we haven't escalated to the extent that i've seen past historical movements escalate um and yeah we've also I mean, there have been waves in the past of where you see an escalation in like state response. And I feel like that's starting to happen across the world now. Um, but, but yeah, like I, I don't know. Right. I don't want that to get worse, yeah, but yeah. You, you, do, you do typically see that happening after a certain amount of time. There's this great um, degrowth scholar, uh, Julia Steinberger, and she's like mm-hmm. just awesome on Twitter. Uh, her work is, her work and her research is awesome, but she's also awesome on Twitter. And mm-hmm. she, um, it was a few weeks ago that there were these like protests um, where the police had gotten like pretty fucking aggressive in Germany mm-hmm. and in the UK and all this sort of stuff. And she uh, tweeted, you know, first they, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you. I guess this is mm-hmm. the stage that we're in now, everyone. You know, mm-hmm. like the fight is coming. Um, it's right. picking up. You can see that in state action now around the world. Um, yeah. in order to protect the existing economy. It's interesting. My mom uh, sent me the article of Germany's raid on the la- uh, last generation, I think. Mm-hmm. It was basically like, she's generally quite supportive of my activism, but she's sort of like, don't do whatever they did to provoke a police raid. And I was like, non-violent direct action. Like, yeah. like, I sort of had to be like, um, oh, sorry, I kind of already did. Yeah. Um, because it is essentially just... Nonviolent resistance. Maybe there was a skosh of ecotage tossed in there. I don't know. But it's yeah. it's really kind of up to the state how they respond. Like when you get large enough and when you get effective enough, the same types of things which provoke no response are provoking, you know, a really disproportionate response. Like we're also seeing this in Atlanta um, where there's this large um, forest that's being turned into a big prison training complex like a, a cop training complex we're calling it cop city oh, God. and you know they've been charging all of the activists with domestic terrorism for what? sitting in trees essentially oh yeah and now they're going after the bail fund they just arrested the people who were organizing the bail fund which is literally just a nonprofit that's collecting funds to help bail out activists which is not illegal mm. um, and is a community it's like a community support mechanism so it's really escalating um down there which you know yeah so i yeah i agree with julia that things are heating up mm-hmm. and that in this movement and that kind of like state response as well will then trigger responses from activists it will trigger an evolution in the kind of action that's being taken i'm not saying this going to trigger it towards sabotage or anything else but there will ha- there has to be a, a change at that point um if you know States crack down, movements don't tend to go, oh, do you know what? Yeah, now that you've cracked down, yeah, right, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think I think that's their hope, obviously, right, is to make everyone afraid of continuing to take action. And, and you know, maybe they would be successful if this wasn't an escalating crisis. Mm-hmm. But, like, the crisis itself is escalating. Like, we're going from a La Nina to an El Nino cycle, which mm-hmm. is essentially these, you know, like, kind of, like, like kind of oscillatory weather patterns um, decadal weather patterns that essentially when we go into El Nino, it creates really warm conditions um, in the ocean that sort of affects the rest of the planet. And so we really expect to see like, you know, like even though we've been breaking temperature records this whole time, like I think it's about to get quite unprecedented um, in this cycle because basically it's like a it's a warmer cycle. I read that we could be looking at breaking, you know, 1.5 this year. Not that it will necessarily stay there, but it's no longer, yeah. you know, 2030 that we're talking about. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're absolutely going to temporarily pass it in the very near future. Um, And, you know, like we, you know, when we talk about tipping points, we usually say like those become more likely than not when sort of stable global average temperature reaches 1.5, which will take, you know, a little bit longer than the sort of first time we temporarily pass it. 
But it's also possible that we've passed of those tipping points already. Like the uncertainty around them is so large. Like I really have the sense that we're playing Russian roulette with the planet. Like mm-hmm. like our major ice sheets could already be fucked and we won't, you know, we just don't know that yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, I don't know, to me, it's just astounding when people say, oh, we have eight years left. We're totally fine. And I'm like, you don't know that. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that's, that is when something becomes more likely than not, which is totally ridiculous to say like, oh, well, I'll play Russian roulette with two bullets out of six chambers and then I'll, I'll stop when there's four bullets out of six chambers. It's like, are you comfortable with that? <laughs> like, scenario? <though? laughs> comfortable with that? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, it's bad. I mean, this is kind of the interesting thing, though, around like the Paris agreements, right? Like the fact that 1.5 got baked in. And I remember, uh, and this is something that I used to parrot, you know, 1.5, 1.5. We're going to, we got to hit 1.5. And then I interviewed um, uh, Earth system scientist James Dyke, and he was like, yeah, um, what about less than 1.5 no, though? You know, like yeah. that, you know, this is the kind of thing that it is not that like we have between now and 1.5 and then things might go a little bit wonky. Like that's like the limits of safety. And what we're even seeing now, like we're at 1.1, 1. 1, 1. 1.2, you know, 250,000 Somalians displaced two weeks ago because a riverbank burst, 33 million uh, people in Pakistan displaced. The coast of Peru is currently on fire. There was flooding in Bologna last week. Like, this is what 1.1 looks like. Mm-hmm. What do you think 1.5 yeah. is going to look like? You know? Oh, it's going to be chaos. Yeah. 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 No, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I think it's really interesting. Just the lack of urgency across every sector of society is so interesting. And even climate scientists, where it's like we know the actual numbers, but it's we've been trained since... Like all of our academic training is essentially like compartmentalization, like how to separate, like you know, the math that we're doing from the way that we feel about it. And so I see people just sort of like shutting it out, sort of almost to protect themselves, right? Like to protect their own psychological state of saying like, okay, well, we're not going to think about this terrifying future. Um, But it's really important. I mean, it's important that we reckon with it. And I think that there are ways to, you know, like feel climate grief and anxiety and use that to motivate action. Um, so, yeah, it always frustrates me when people are like, oh, we can't think about this because it's going to make us sad. And it's like, you know. Feel sad. Sad and dead. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel it. Feel it and do something about it if, if possible. Right. Okay. Rose, I think that's actually a pretty important note to end on. So my final question for you is, who would you like to platform? Oh, my gosh. Well, we already mentioned a lot of very cool people. Um, So, yeah, um, I don't know if you've already like you should definitely speak to like, yeah, Julia Steinberger, Dana Fisher, like those are all academics who are doing fantastic work. Um, But I also think there's a lot of great stuff happening in the youth movement, like the fossil free research groups. Um, Alana Cohen, for example, who is working with fossil free research, is now getting into, um, I think she's thinking of studying sort of the more like legal aspects of of how to, you know, work against the fossil fuel industry from a more legal standpoint, which is also super interesting and important. Um, there's so much energy in our youth movement. And also there's a lot of um, kind of indigenous coalitions coming together around in Bridge Line 5, which is crossing through um Wisconsin. It's going to cross through the Great Lakes essentially and potentially pollute a lot of the waterway up there, which is, Ugh. yeah, pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there are a lot of um, groups up there like Anishinaabe nations um, from both sides of the border and, and other like, you know, there's like a variety of indigenous groups up there that are working together with like other groups like Third Act um, and local politicians to really try and stop Line 5. Um, right now it's sort of moving through the political process, but I'm sure it's it's going to eventually come to occupation and blockade as well. All right. Rose, thank you so much for your time today. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good discussion. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.